China's commercial interests in Africa have been called a new form of colonialism by some in the West. Many Africans say that China is a better partner than Europe or the US. But what's the reality in the African nation with the longest standing links to China? If there are anywhere else to go, where they find conditions like what is in Zambia, they would not be here. Last year, as Zambia prepared to elect a new president, China's involvement became a divisive political issue. We sent Salan Shatalad to find out why. Zambia is home to thousands of Chinese. The Chinese are involved in everything from farms to factories, mines to medicine, restaurants to retail. Every Trade between China and Africa has exploded from $10 billion to more than $100 billion in the last decade. Many outside commentators question China's motives for being here, calling it a new form of colonialism. They say the Chinese are exploiting Zambians and maltreating their workers. But what do Zambians think? I can't think of a sector which has no Chinese investment. The Chinese are maltreating Zambians because the Zambians have to enjoy our wealth given by the Almighty God. When they buy a house, no one's complaining about Chinese money. When you get a good price value for your house, you're saying thank you very much. In 2011, tensions with Chinese investors emerged into politics. I came to Zambia at election time earlier this year to find out what the politicians and the people were saying. There were two main candidates, the incumbent, President Rupia Banda, whose party has ruled the country for 20 years, and his main opponent, Michael Sata of the Patriotic Front, so-called King Cobra, a popular politician with a sharp and venomous tongue, sometimes directed at the Chinese. There is nowhere in the part of Zambia where people are so enthusiastic about the Chinaman. I caught up with the president, Rupia Banda, as he landed in the Copper Belt for a major rally. All the roads have been cleared for the presidential convoy, and here we are following, not really knowing exactly where we're going and trying not to have an accident along the way. Uh, Solange? Come in, come in. I wanted to know what the president thought about the Chinese in Zambia. An appropriate time, just before we go to the gallows. Yes. <laughs> there is this misconception amongst the media who are trying to make it appear as if uh, China is a potential colonialist and so on. They don't have to be colonialists. They are big enough. They, they can survive. They have enough problems in their own country of poverty and so on, and they are concentrating on that. Many of them whom we allow to work in this country it is for specific periods. They come for a contract to build a road from point A to point B. When they're finished, they leave it. The other thing I like about the Chinese, they are teaching our people the work ethic. They are people are learning to work hard, work late. As long as they are paid adequately, people are ready to work. And the Chinese are teaching us that. I like the Chinese because uh, they've brought uh, development in our country. They've developed our country, at least they've uh, relieved our minds. The minds were closed, but because of Chinese, our minds are opened. What did Banda's opponent, Michael Sata, think about the Chinese? To find out, I followed him to a rally in a village. Today, we have in Zambia children who are 11, 12 years old who have never seen the door of a classroom. In previous election campaigns, Sata has used anti-Chinese rhetoric to gain popularity, but this time he was toning it down. 
What did his supporters think? We don't have any problems with the Chinese as long as they leave certain industries for um, Zambians. You know what I mean? But um, as long as they're investors and they respect Zambian laws, we don't have a problem with investors at all. To many people, Sata is a champion of anti-Chinese sentiment in Africa. But in private, he seemed more conciliatory. The Chinese are very hard-working people. And if, if any country uses them properly, you can benefit quite a lot. Okay. <laughs> the Chinese don't look at the working, the working hours. They work in, it only when the sun goes down. That's when they go to work. I travelled with him in his campaign helicopter back to the city of Ndola. I wanted to find out what his position on the Chinese in Zambia was and where the negative comments were coming from. The reason why people are talking too much about the Chinese is because they, are very, they have been very outstanding in their corruption. They have been very outstanding in getting favours from the current government. That's why the Chinese are on everybody's lips. The Chinese bring laborers to push wheelbarrows, which is wrong. The Chinese, they don't follow the minimum wage when they are paying their people. The Chinese have no condition of service. They don't provide protective clothing. So the list is endless. Such comments were making Chinese investors in Zambia nervous and uncertain whether a SATA victory would force them to leave. The guilt are always afraid. And if you are talking of the moving investment, where else can they take it? If they had anywhere else to go, mm -hmm. where they find conditions like what is in Zambia, they would not be here. Because the opportunities we have here, they won't find them anywhere else. So are you saying those opportunities will remain after... What we are trying to, to say, the Chinese should not be scared. They should be transparent. Zambia and China's relationship goes back a long way. Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, Zambia's first president, established relations with China at independence in 1964 after being turned down assistance from the West. And uh, how are you feeling these days? Well, feeling all right, thank you. Yeah. He continues mm -hmm. to pay tribute to China and defends increasing cooperation between the two countries. When um, we were struggling for our independence, we understood that um, Chairman Mao and his Prime Minister Cho and Lai we are ready to assist those who are genuinely fighting for their independence. China's first major commitment to Africa was the construction of a colossal 1,800-kilometer railway that connects landlocked Zambia to the sea via Tanzania. This strategic access to the coast allowed Zambia to bypass colonial regimes surrounding it. For the retention of Zambia, as a force, a support force for the liberation of Southern Africa. The gesture of Tazara is invaluable. Over the years, as both countries moved away from a centrally planned economy towards a market-driven economy, the basis of their relationship changed from political solidarity to partners in economic development. Today, China needs Zambian copper to produce the goods that it sells to consumers around the world. When Tazara was constituted, I think zero copper went to China. Now maybe half or three quarters of the copper in Zambia is destined to, to China. But despite growing trade ties, a series of disturbing incidents in Chinese companies have stirred public discontent. In April 2005, for example, 51 people were killed in an accident at a Chinese-owned explosive factory in copper mine in Chambishi, raising concerns over poor safety standards. Then in October 2010, Chinese supervisor at Column Coal Mine shot at protesting workers who had massed outside the gate demanding higher pay and improved conditions. 13 people were injured. There were no fatalities. So my the shooters were charged with attempted murder, but as facts became clearer, the charge was reduced to attempt to cause grievous bodily harm. After the victims were compensated, prosecutors dropped all charges. 
The global media interest in these two incidents created the impression that such events are common in Chinese-run companies in Zambia. Nevertheless, poor labor standards are widespread throughout the country, not just in Chinese-run companies. We have seen a situation after privatization where most of the permanent pensionable jobs have been casualized, meaning people are put on a month's contract, three months contract, six months contract. And so long as the tenure of contract is small, people can't plan. Working conditions began to deteriorate in the 90s amid a wave of privatization pushed on by international institutions and Western donors. With the state's role diminished, regulations were left open to exploitation. The mining companies themselves have huge experience in working in countries like Zambia. Uh, most of these work in other places. They know and how to take advantage of the vulnerability of poor, corrupt governments. Um, and definitely they have more sophisticated um, ways of dealing with tax accounting. For example, they have the best tax accountants, best lawyers. So on top of that, it's quite possible that they're just using legal means to avoid paying as much tax as they should. I went to the Chinese embassy to put some of these allegations to the new ambassador. We are not uh, law enforcement agencies, and if, if one Chinese guy is not doing things very well, we cannot put him into the jail. We, we can, you know, communicate and we can devise. Um, so your law enforcement is the responsibility of the Zambian government. If Chinese companies doing wrong things or violating Zambian uh, laws, they should be punished according to the, the law of the land. In Africa, we do not talk much. We build the roads, we build airports, we build the railways, we, we, we build you know, stadiums, uh, we build the schools, and uh, we build the hospitals everywhere. Even the African Union headquarters being built by China. Yeah, no, I just have the yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are doers. The doers always get criticism. In China also, those one never do anything. They make comments, but those one or doers always being criticized. Unfortunately. <laughs> Although many Zambians welcome the jobs provided by Chinese firms, some of the actions of Chinese supervisors are less welcome. It's just like pushing, because they don't know how to throw punches, you know. Yeah, so they, they will just push you, yeah. For not push you, then he, this year, <laughs> grab your this ear. year, <laughs> yeah, that teach you there, like a, a small son. Yeah? Small son, come here, should understand, okay. That is no, no good. I wanted to find out what the opinions of the politicians meant to the Chinese living in Zambia. Most of them have come on their own free will to work, follow loved ones, or start their own business. Liu Changming used to work for the government in the Chinese province of Jiangsu. He's been here more than 10 years and now he's a farmer. I asked him what makes Chinese entrepreneurs different to those from other countries. Mr. Liu lives on the outskirts of town with his wife and two young children. His wife helps on the farm and his children are growing up Zambian. I stayed in Zambia for a long time, so just once I went back to China, then I started, and then I started having a flu. So this year, I want to go back when it's hot, or next year. I asked his wife what she would think if her daughter were to grow up and marry a Zambian. She introduced me to the workers. 
Okay, for our boss, he can shout at you if you are wrong. After five minutes, you resolve the issue. But I hate some of the Chinese, it's persistence. If there is a difference, that differences can go on and go on. But for him, just for a short period of time, then you reconcile, you start working, you go about work. So that's the most good part about our boss. Well, you have to take care of Sunshare set up in Lusaka two years ago. It already employs more than 90 Zambians and a dozen Chinese. It's now looking to expand. His assistant, Mandarin-speaking Zambian David Mumbi, spends much of his time helping staff avoid misunderstandings. In China, it's most, most, most workers know that it's a general rule for every company to ask you to finish up all the work before you uh, knock off. But here, you would find workers would, would relax with that and say, OK, I'll finish it up tomorrow. And that can be a bit of a problem. Like many companies, Sunshare would like to stay in Zambia regardless of the election result. It's voting day, and in the opposition stronghold of Lusaka, there's a sense that this could be their year. In previous elections, there were accusations of vote rigging. Those fears and accusations have resurfaced in 2011. What you're suggesting is that people have been coming in with fake road, yes, registra yes, voters' yes. registration yes, cards, yes. and they have been putting them in these plastic yes, yes. folders and then using them as legitimate votes. Yes, so yes. In effect, exactly. inflating the number of votes. Exactly. Exactly. That's why you're finding registers from different polling stations here. So it's an advertisement that goes on the outside of a polling station. It's not a ballot paper. But there are too many. Guy Scott is the vice president of Satter's opposition party. He was concerned the ruling party could be trying to steal this election. If you run a country where it's possible not to play by the rules, you don't play by the rules. They make fake ballot papers. Sometimes they just cut it like this. Then they give a person and go and vote. What a country. Shame, shame, Zambia, shame, rubbish. Back in the factory, workers and management were discussing what to do in case the situation deteriorates. In the copper belt, they are saying they are not working even the pupils for school. Uh -huh. They are not going to school. Yes, I understand. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the fear is maybe when we come, it will be OK, but when going back, going back, don't worry, we can stand the they car. They can even break the car. You see that road, you <laughs> didn't do uh -huh. it yesterday. We can go the other way, don't worry. <laughs> And I therefore declare Michael Chirusha Sata to be duly elected as the President of the Republic of Zambia this 23rd day of September 2011. Despite accusations of vote rigging, Michael Sata won the election by 200,000 votes. The reception in Lusaka was immediate and lasted well into the night. I joined thousands of SATA supporters who had gathered to witness the swearing-in of their new president. What is your feeling this morning? Nothing. My problem now is the problems are ahead of us. So there's nothing to be excited, there's nothing to be emotional. It's to start thinking 
Where do we come from here? The nation is, is very excited. People are in the streets. Well, the nation wants us to satisfy them. That's, if they are excited, well and good. But, uh, but we have to just wait and see. I asked the new Minister of Information, given Lubinda, whether he had a particular message for the Chinese. Let them feel very much at home. They are very welcome in Zambia. They should not feel that uh, there is a party that is going to kick them out of this country. We want them to stay in Zambia. The only thing is that it's not directed at them particularly. We're not against any particular nationality. Our message is towards all investors. Be they Zambian or Chinese or American or South African or Canadian, our message to them is that please respect the local labor laws. Please respect our Zambian workers, with, uh, treat them with respect and give them a fair living wage. President Michael Santa has pledged to create a working partnership with current and foreign investors, including those intending to invest in the country's economy. A day after the results were announced, I drove into central Lusaka to meet Mr. Liu, the farmer. Like every other morning, he was in the market conducting business as usual. I asked him what he thought of Sata's victory. I asked him whether the result would have an effect on his business. China's growing interest in Africa has attracted attention from the United States. In June 2011, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton traveled to Zambia to promote American trade. She cautioned Africa against a new form of colonialism as China expands its ties with the continent. At a reception hosted by the Chinese embassy to mark the anniversary of the People's Republic of China, I asked the U.S. ambassador what Clinton meant. On these questions that were asked to her by reporters, about what China is doing here. She emphasized that everybody who's coming to invest and to work in Africa really needs to make a contribution. One of the phrases she used was, while you're doing well, you should also do good. And she meant money can be made, but you should also support domestic employment. You should also support uh, investment in factories here. Uh, and you should also support good labor practices. I think some of Hillary's comments we're a bit out of line, the whole thing of what do they leave here? They leave nothing and we come in. They've got to remember that don't meddle. You know, we've been meddled with for a long time. And it's actually one of the refreshing things with the Chinese is that they're here to do business. As a grouping and as an invasion, um, some people have a, an emotional reaction, a slightly xenophobic reaction. But when it comes down to individual interaction, even those people saying, oh, we can't sell out to the Chinese, they're, they're quite happy to sit across the table and develop a, a close friendship. My time in Zambia had reinforced my belief that this is a complicated relationship involving hundreds of companies and thousands of different individuals. Perhaps Sata's election was a sign of change in this part of Africa. Perhaps not. While Chinese investment is clearly important to Zambia and to the rest of Africa, it's also clear that Zambians are determined to take greater control of their own lives and future, choosing who to work with and how. Meanwhile, the people just get on with it.